Yeah, okay, while, I do you, have... while you're figuring out, uh, just let me tell you about uh, Afik. Afik has got a YouTube channel, uh, which he, uh, he has some very good videos. I think he's, he's put a lot of effort into his videos. It's got some really good special effects and whatnot to try and explain. He, he to try and explain what he's trying to explain. Uh, I, so if you guys are looking for a YouTube channel to follow, I think you should follow his YouTube channel. What, what's the what's the YouTube channel name again? Uh, it's called Science Epic. Uh, I'll link it in the comments. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, off you go. All right. Uh, can Can you guys see the slide? I can. All right. Can you guys see? Right, let me. I'll stand back. Can you hear me? I can. All right. Uh, that's good. Thanks. Um, well, anyway, uh, thank you, Pepper, for that introduction. And uh, I just w I was wondering how much time do I have? Forty five minutes, right? Yes. Okay, uh, that's good. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Afik, and I've been quite a long time member of the Apostles now for about uh, 10, almost 10 years. <laughs> I remember we were all just some geeks interested in, in science and hanging out with um, the, the legend uh, Willy Po, and uh, we were talking about things at the Kuala Lumpur venue. And that, that was like when I was in my undergraduate days. And uh, recently, and I was always interested in space and astronomy. Uh, and, and recently I, I've been able to make the move towards understanding the universe in a more academic sense. Uh, I, re oops, sorry. I recently uh, completed my master's at uh, the Institute of Radio Astronomy and Space Research at Auckland University of Technology. Uh, I've submitted my thesis and I'm just waiting for the results. Um, and I'm going to be giving this talk. Um, so this is what you're seeing right now is the 30 meter and the 12 meter dish at uh, Warkworth Radio Astronomical Observatory in New Zealand. Um, this is me right next to the dish. Um, it was formerly a uh, mobile satellite community. Now the 12 meter dish on the right was purpose built for science, but the the dish on the left, the 30 meter, was uh, reverse engineered from a satellite ground station to become a radio telescope. So uh, kind of like a dual use of technology. And um, fun fact, uh, to, to keep the lights on at the Institute, we actually take uh, contracts from SpaceX. Whenever they have a payload delivery to the ISS, we actually track their packages for them. So it's that's uh, how we pay the bills and keep the telescope running. Uh, interesting stuff. Uh, this is me at the station north north of Auckland. Um, this is the team. Uh, I just wanted to show you guys that uh, astronomers are just people too. Uh, you know, we're just humans curious about uh, wanting to know more about the universe. Uh, I'm there in the center, uh, one big happy family. Um, so my supervisor is on the far right, uh, and the director of this institute is this guy right here, uh, Professor Sergey Kuryaev. Uh, so I've, I've left uh, New Zealand, I'm back in Malaysia, and I'm just enduring with everyone else, you know, just going through these uh, troubled times. And I always enjoy communication, and uh, I believe that outreach is, a, is an important part of uh, the the duty of an astronomer and a scientist. So uh, this talk is uh, supposed to be as an introduction, very layman, simple talk uh, called Pulsars, the incredible physics of incredible stars. I'll be talking about what I studied under the Institute, some of the subject matters, uh, you know, exposing the general public to that kind of stuff. Um, so I'd like to open everyone's perception up to the this concept of the invisible cosmos. And that is, um, the universe that exists outside uh, optical light, the light that we see with our eyes. Uh, you can see the, these images right here are all the center of the galaxy, but uh, taken in different wavelengths of light. Uh, from uh, very energetic gamma rays, uh, we, we can see like um, we are sensitive to supernovas. In uh, infrared, we are able to see, uh, study protoplanetary disks, uh, young uh, planets forming around distant stars. And uh, if you think light, which is simply a wave, right? And you, you uh, scrunch it together, it becomes high frequency, uh, becomes gamma rays, uh, short, short wavelength, high frequency. And if you stretch out light, it becomes uh, radio waves, 
uh, and microwaves and uh, in radio waves, we can actually map a lot of different things out uh, like uh, the hydrogen in our galaxy uh, and magnetic fields in, in the universe, the things that we wouldn't normally be able to see with our eyes and with optical telescopes. Uh, and one of the things that um, we can study in radio waves and radio astronomy is, uh, oops, got, oops, sorry, uh, that we can study in radio astronomy is, oh, I'm not, uh, this, this slide is supposed to, oh, sorry, um, it's a, it's a video, like, I, oh, I didn't, Sorry, uh, let me let me grab the video. <laughs> I, basically, for the past two years, uh, I've been studying pulsars. Uh, uh, pulsars are neutron stars. Um, they are highly magnetized, rapidly rotating neutron stars with uh, very strong magnetic fields. That works. And uh, they they rotate because of conservation of angular momentum and uh, they have this very strong magnetic field and they emit these beams of uh, electromagnetic radiation that sweep across our line of sight like um, a lighthouse and we see them as like flashing uh, flashing radio lighthouses in the, in the universe uh, and they're useful in many ways i'm just going to keep looping over this animation because i think it's wonderful uh, they are very precise uh, celestial clocks. They can be um, on longer time scales. They can be used to calibrate uh, atomic clocks that tend to drift over time. Uh, you can use a, a, an array of pulsars to, uh, to navigate satellites and to navigate interplanetary space, spacecraft. And that's being tested by NASA and the Chinese Space Agency. And you can also use pulsars as uh, as, a, as mechanisms to to test uh, theories of gravity, as uh, test masses for Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is what I'll be talking about, um, which is what my talk will be leaning on. Uh, now, they were discovered in 1968 by this wonderful person right here, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, uh, using the interplanetary scintillation array, and that that word scintillation. Uh, is it okay if I just use uh, the without full screen? Or I think I'll do just in case. Or okay. Uh, in late 1960s, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell with her supervisor Anthony Hewish were uh, looking at quasars, um, which are distant uh, supermassive black holes that are nucleating. Um, quasars and they wanted to see the twinkling of the quasar and that's what scintillation means it's, it's simply twinkling and they found this source uh, that repeated every 1.3 seconds and that kept to sidereal time meaning that uh, for every rotation of the earth with respect to all of the stars this source cp 1919 appeared at the same time every night so that's when they knew that it wasn't just interference it was uh, some sort of naturally emitting uh, source of radio waves. And uh, at first, of course, uh, with many things in astronomy, you don't understand. Uh, you think it's aliens. <laughs> they call the signal little green men because it was very periodic with a period of 1.33 seconds. Uh, it turns out it wasn't uh, aliens. It was actually um, pulsars, uh, highly magnetized neutron stars. Uh, next slide. Uh, which are created from uh, the birth of massive stars. Uh, whenever you have a star that's 10 to 20 times more massive than the sun, um, within that limit, uh, you have, uh, you, it goes supernova and it, you produce this compact mass uh, that um, the limit of that is the Chandrasekhar limit, I think. Uh, it's about two, two solar masses two solar mass compact mass uh, with it's bounded between the Chandrasekhar limit and the Tolman Oppenheimer Volkov limit and that's where the, the neutron star pulsar lives uh, beyond the the TOV limit you get black holes which is which is another uh, monster entirely but um, 
it's often said that uh, massive stars, they only live for millions of years. They live like rock stars. Uh, they, they die young and they, they leave behind beautiful corpses. And some of those uh, extreme beautiful corpses are neutron stars and black holes. So these things are made out, out of degenerate matter. And uh, really, um, Jocelyn Bell and uh, Anthony Hewish won the Nobel Prize for their discovery because no one uh, knew that stars could be made out of degenerate matter at the time. No one had any evidence. Yeah. It's a completely different type of star, uh, pulsars. So um, this is kind of like a model of a pulsar. You have these uh, a magnetosphere with uh, magnetic fields and is, there's a rotational axis and a magnetic axis that's uh, offset. And uh, at these polar caps, um, magnetic field polar caps is where uh, electron-positron uh, pairs are formed and are accelerated outwards into space. And that's where we get that lighthouse effect. Uh, whenever this beam sweeps across our line of sight, right? And while I was doing my research for, for these slides, I, I encountered this picture right here. Uh, and they were trying to illustrate the fact that this, this pulsar uh, rotates and emits their beam. But what I realized about this picture is that it's very scary. Uh, well, it's not to scale. It's not to scale because um, the pulsar is actually 10 to 20 kilometers in diameter. It's actually very small. So what you have is a, is a star the size of a city, a star pretty much the size of Kuala Lumpur, the size of KL, um, but with more stuff in it, more matter in it than our mm -hmm. entire solar system. So how, how's about that for extremes? They are um, excellent for uh, extreme physical laboratories, uh, conditions that are very hard to find in the universe. Uh, but what's scary about this, this image is that Earth is depicted to be this, this close to, to a neutron star. And like, to, uh, to be honest, I would not wanna be this close to one of these things uh, because the, they have extremely powerful, uh, extremely strong magnetic fields. And if we were this close, uh, you would end up uh, wiping out every hard disk on planet Earth. You would just erase every hard disk. Uh, and also the intense gravitational uh, forces uh, field of the pulsar would probably uh, tear apart the planet. So I just thought this, this picture was really cool and funny. <laughs> uh, so uh, pulsars, uh, when, you, when they are born, they, are, they produce incredible uh, corpses, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, this is uh, one example. Uh, it's the Crab Nebula which was uh, created from the a supernova that was observed in uh, 1054 as a visiting uh, guest star uh, that, that shone a thousand uh, years ago at that time. And at the heart of this image is a pulsar, the crab pulsar that rotates about 30 times per second. And, and it emits an energetic particle wind that uh, is uh, responsible for the brightness of the crab nebula. I'll, I'll show another one after this. Uh, this is the Vila, which is also, oh, it's not static. It's, yeah. So this is the, uh, the Vila pulsar, um, which you can see that particle wind kind of like streaming out the back there. But what's interesting about this image is, are these concentric uh, shells. And that's um, known as the, we refer to that as the pulsar wind nebula or a, a plarion, uh, where you have that energetic part, part uh, when a when a a boat moves through the ocean. Uh, the three D when when you have all that the outflowing winds from the pulsar crashing against the the interstellar medium. You have this thing called a bow shock or bow shock nebula. So they're very, uh, what I just wanted to show is that pulsars are very highly energetic and they're really extreme. Um, so the, the one thing that uh, about pulsars was their, the periodic nature of their signal. Uh, so you can apply some uh, data sonification to this. Uh, I'm gonna, do you guys hear anything? They have this uh, very 
repetitive uh, signal um, with its own uh, relative to their, to their spin frequency. And uh, so these two are actually very special right here. Uh, you'll notice that their, their period is measured in several milliseconds. And that's uh, a different class of pulsar known as the millisecond pulsar. Uh, can I confirm that people are hearing the audio? Is hello? Uh, uh, I can't hear it. So why don't you just make the sound yourself? Okay. <laughs> so uh, a bunch of people, uh, uh, really funny, smart people, uh, applied data sonification to the the frequency of the the pulsar, and you can hear something like but it's kind of like a, a beating frequency. <laughs> I refrain from saying beat frequency because it, it, it's related to something else, but. Right. And so uh, when you have this class of pulsar that's, that's, really, that's really fast, um, that where their period is like only five milliseconds, one turn is five milliseconds, they make this sound right here. Oh yeah. Turn off my. Yeah, and so I've I've highlighted uh, the this pulsar. Well, I'll give you guys another one. This is another millisecond pulsar. Uh, this is Vila just now. And here's a crab pulsar. Yeah, it's because of that uh, repetitive signal that um, with its own frequency that we can uh, have these amazing sounds. And uh, there was this uh, composer uh, from France who turned, who took the pulsar signal and turned it into a, a, a composition. Um, maybe a bit faint, but you can look it up. Uh, it's called uh, Le Noir de l'Etoile, The Dark of the Stars, and um, it uses the pulsar's sound to as part of the music, which, you know, it's, it's like a, a meshing of both science and art, art and science. Sometimes science is more art than science. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so moving onwards um, to the slightly more initiated among you, you might be familiar with the Hertzsprung Russell diagram or HR diagram, which gives uh, the distribution of stars as a function of their luminosity and their spectral class or their color. Um, but these are for main sequence stars, but stars eventually evolve as they burn out their nuclear fuel, uh, exhaust their nuclear fuel, they go supernova or they, uh, they, they move on into their next stage in life. And pulsars actually have this uh, similar type of uh, evolutionary diagram where they are born uh, after a supernova, they, they begin their existence at this center of the diagram right here. And uh, as they age, their spin, their rotational frequencies uh, decrease, their uh, spin period increases. So the spinning eventually, after millions of years, the, the pulsars uh, spin down uh, until the point where they cross this line right here called the death line, in which case they, they, they no longer spin and they become humdrum quiescent neutron stars that no longer can be observed. But there's a way in which pulsars can avoid this fate. And if they were, Part of a binary uh, system, if they had a partner, um, they can actually accrete, suck off, well, siphon mass off of the partner uh, and become spun up again, uh, recycled. And that's where we get, uh, and they're, uh, they're spun up all the way uh, to become the millisecond pulsars that I talked about earlier, those ones with the very uh, high pitched tones. Uh, so this is uh, the vertical axis here is spin derivative, which is the 
the rate at which the spin frequency slows down. And uh, the x-axis here is spin period, which is the time it takes to complete one uh, cycle. So what I mean to say is that there's, there's different types of pulsars, and they're all characterized by this graph, uh, by this PP dot diagram. It's called a, a PP dot diagram, which is, which is like the a degenerate, <laughs> uh, an equivalent for degenerate stars um, living out the next phase of their lives. And this top right corner right here is uh, where the magnetars exist. And that's also another type of extreme uh, type of pulsars um, with very even much stronger magnetic fields. So if you notice these uh, uh, lines right here actually measure the magnetic fields. That's 10 to the 14 Gauss uh, on this um, dashed line. So that's a uh, Terra Gauss magnetic field. Um, and uh, millisecond pulsars have much weaker magnetic fields because uh, something happens during that uh, accretion process that dampens the field. Uh, and my, my master's thesis was, I was looking at a millisecond pulsar and I'll talk about what I did for my master's thesis towards the end of this talk. Um, they've, uh, pulsars have made their way into pop culture. This is the album cover of uh, Joy Division, Unknown Pleasures, which is uh, this English rock band. Um, and this is one of their album covers. This is actually the, the signal from uh, the pulse profiles of CP1919, which is the first ever pulsar that was discovered. And they used it for their album cover, which is dope. Uh, if you're familiar with the Voyager Golden Records, <laughs> The these this these markings right here are the, the Voyager spacecraft was sent in the 1970s uh, as an emissary to the stars by the inhabitants of planet Earth, and these uh, markings right here uh, is a map uh, that puts Earth at the center and relative to the position of several pulsars in the galaxy. Uh, these these scratches, these etches right here um, denote the frequency or like a spin frequency or it's the same thing. Frequency is period one over F. Uh, uh, rotational frequency of the pulsar with this, the length of the line, the length of this line is uh, some sort of distance. So if any aliens ever find the Voyager spacecraft, they can po potentially triangulate the location of planet Earth here at the center. And uh, I can say from the literature that uh, human beings have already started doing this for, um, are starting to use this to navigate interplanetary spacecraft. And there's some research uh, already been done where you can actually use pulsars to localize your position to within 20 kilometers in space, which is pretty awesome because 20 kilometer accuracy in space is huge. So it will be useful for, uh, you know, they are like cosmic lighthouses. We can use them to navigate and it'll be useful for uh, navigation of interplanetary spacecraft. Now, <laughs> this is the part where I want to refrain for a bit and I can ask the question, where can we possibly go from here? What's more awesome than a neutron star? What's more awesome than a pulsar? Well, you might be inclined to say black hole. Well, that's true, but uh, that, that's also very true. But um, what happens when you have uh, two pulsars <laughs> or together in one system, a binary pulsar? And that's exactly what was discovered in 1970s in pulsar 1913, the neutron star binary, also known as the Hulse-Taylor binary and uh, which was a pulsar orbiting another neutron star. This one is already quiescent and this one was uh, still emitting its radio uh, beams. And what, what this allowed us to do actually is allowed us to test uh, theories of gravity. Um, now, there's, uh, there are six uh, parameters that model an orbit. They're called the Keplerian orbits, right? But we have, for example, uh, after the you know classical physics, uh, Einstein came along with relativistic physics, and uh, with relativistic physics comes relativistic parameters to model an orbit. Uh, and this kind of highly relativistic system, 
with uh, very extreme physical conditions allows us, allows us to model several post Keplerian parameters, uh, basically uh, relativistic corrections to the, the classical orbit parameters. And uh, for this system, PSR 1913, uh, it was found out that the orbit was shrinking. Like when it was studied in 1974, the pulsars were going around each other. And by timing the, 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 the pulses from the pulsar, it was found out that the, the orbit between the two was shrinking. Uh, and that's this uh, parameter called period derivative. And I wrote it in my notes, yeah. So there are, there are several post-Keplerian parameters. Um, the rate at which the orbit was shrinking is called the period derivative. There's also a precession of the periastron. When uh, relativity was first uh, discovered in 1915, if you, I mean, we used to watch a lot of uh, science documentaries back in the day, but how they proved relativity was they, they used, they studied the precession of the orbit of Mercury, right? How it would change uh, on some, some time basis. And this is kind of like a, a highly relativistic equivalent of that, the, the precession of the periastron. Yeah, um, but these things allow us to put, essentially put Einstein on trial to, to test Einstein's theories because we wouldn't find any similar extreme environments like this within our solar system. Uh, please, like, I'm sorry to be, to kind of like, um, to put this math up there, but don't, don't get intimidated by the math. I, I simply took this from uh, some example website. And I, the, the important thing here is that this graph on the right, this uh, waterfall shaped graph on the right, where you have this, the, the orbit is shrinking due to, and, and the reason why it was shrinking is because uh, it's, the system is radiating it outwards in the form of gravitational waves. So, also something uh, very incredible. Um, there was also uh, at the beginning of this decade, was it, no, at the beginning of this um, millennia in 2003, uh, a neutron, a pulsar, I should change this to not, a pulsar binary was discovered where it was two neutron stars, two pulsars going around each other. So in the previous case, it was just one pulsar and one neutron star. And in this case, it was, uh, two uh, pulsars that were still emitting their, their radio pulses. And this uh, allowed us to, uh, to acquire even more post-Keplerian parameters, um, gravitational redshift and Shapiro delay. And uh, again, I'm putting jargon on, on, your, uh, on your plate, but uh, what, I, what I just want you to think about is that the, how do we know Einstein was right? And he's made several predictions that uh, space time is curved and we can test the curvature of space time with pulsars because they, because of their, they're so compact, so much mass within such small space, they, 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 they warp the space around them extremely and they also emit these beams. And so these parameters uh, are, allow us to, to, to test Einstein's theory of general relativity, and we can measure them from pulsars. And in, in an even more extreme case, um, from this double double pulsar system, um, by fitting, okay, these, these are the things that I've been talking about, this uh, omega dot, r, s, gamma, a gravitational redshift, by constraining the, by putting them into functions, linking the pulsar masses, we can actually estimate the, the mass, the allowed masses of the pulsar. And this allows us to eventually one day uh, by doing more of this kind of study to figure out the, the equation of state of the pulsar, essentially uh, how, what's the pulsar made out of because no one really knows at this point. They're, they're made out of degenerate um, atomic nuclei. Oh yeah, <laughs> fun, interesting fact. Uh, pulsars themselves are neutron stars they are essentially giant atomic nuclei. If you've ever wanted to know what uh, the, the heart of an atom looks like, go look at a pulsar, but I don't recommend you go too close because of the insane title of gravitational effects. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's another interesting thing. I'm gonna play this slide. Okay, so if you might recall the uh, event horizon 
black hole image uh, produced in 2019. Um, now, somewhere in the universe, a pair of these supermassive black holes uh, at the heart of galaxies are actually merging into each other or colliding. Galaxies merge, they collide, and as they're colliding, they are producing gravitational waves, gravitational radiation that propagates out through space, uh, distorting space as they travel, um, and such that uh, gravitational waves going into this image would warp space. The gravitational waves are propagating distortions of space-time. Um, the our proper distance to the pulsar will actually change, uh, such that uh, for pulsars separated 90 degrees apart, they have this anti-correlated timing patterns. And we can actually use an ensemble of uh, pulsars, millisecond pulsars, because uh, they, they, their timing is very stable, to as a detector for gravitational waves. And that's called, uh, oh, that's called a pulsar timing array. We can use an ensemble of millisecond pulsars to detect gravitational waves by precisely timing pulsars in one part of the sky and timing pulsars in another part of the sky and looking for a very subtle difference in their arrival times. There's a pattern in the difference of their arrival times. We can use them to detect gravitational waves. Uh, so it's similar to the concept of LIGO, the Light Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, except in our case, uh, the pulsars are detecting gravitational waves in a different uh, frequency band, the nanohertz frequency, whereas LIGO is detecting uh, gravitational waves in the kilohertz. So that's that's interesting that we can use pulsars for uh, this kind of application uh, to detect gravitational waves. So, but there's a problem though. <laughs> the the interstellar medium, the the ionized gas and dust between the stars kind of uh, scatters and refracts the pulsar emission such that a very sharp pulse becomes uh, scatter broadened in time. And this throws off the timing of the pulsar. So, which makes the timing of pulsars difficult, which introduces noise into the, the gravitational wave uh, observations. So that's where I came in with my, my research that I was doing last year uh, as the COVID pandemic was hitting the world. Uh, I've, I've been analyzing, I analyzed data from the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa uh, to kind of look at how the pulsars uh, scintillate, how they twinkle. Uh, and by looking at that scintillation, we can actually probe the, the plasma that causes the pulsar emission to scatter and become scatter broadened. And we're hoping that we can invent methods to correct for this interstellar delay. So this is what the data looks like. This is what actual astronomical data, like what an astronomer, well, one that is interested in pulsar scintillation would look at. It's called dynamic spectra. Uh, the horizontal, the vertical axis is frequency, the horizontal axis is time. And they're, they're actually quite beautiful because you know you, you get into astronomy thinking that you'd be looking at pretty pictures all day, but here you go and you realize that, oh, there's, there's math. <laughs> There's also some numbers here, but um, so these are scintles, essentially the, the twinkling of the pulsar across frequency and time, um, the fluctuation because of those ionized uh, gas and plasma between the stars, uh, we have these scintles. And I, I apply this algor algorithm. Oh, okay, I'm talking about this. So my... My thesis was entitled uh, Study of Birefringent Scintillation, uh, a study of birefringent scintillation towards the millisecond pulsar 0437 minus 4715. So 0437 minus 4715 is the, is the right ascension and declination, essentially how you find the pulsar in the sky. So you, you, you all can go out now and find something in the sky. You're all astronomers now. You can go out and look for something uh, using the right ascension and declination. Um, so that plasma that uh, that impedes that scatters the pulsar emission is is birefringent, meaning that it has uh, different indices of refraction for different polarizations of light, for uh, right circularly polarized and left circularly polarized. And I, I took spectra of LCP and RCP, and I'm trying to find very subtle differences between them. Um, that's Pretty much the gist of it, and there's there's a certain phase difference between the LCP and RCP spectra, 
and I was trying to detect that. Um, so some people in the 1980s had tried this, but the technology was kind of limited at the time. Uh, they were using Arecibo telescope. Um, yeah, they they put some upper limits. Like I haven't touched this stuff in a while. I, I submitted my thesis, and then I'm like, what next? I'm just been chilling at home and doing other projects. But this is our methodology. We we take uh, LCP and RCP, and uh, we we look for their difference. Uh, we take the Fourier transform of that difference, and we want to see if any parabolic arcs emerge. And uh, if we take a cross correlation between the LCP and RCP, we're hoping to see some sort of uh, secondary cross spectra parabolic arcs. Now, these parabolic arcs are interesting because they, they are kind of the forefront of astronaut of pulsar scintillation research. Currently, uh, they it's because of uh, multiple imaging of the pulsar in the interstellar medium. Uh, we have and this relationship between uh, Doppler shift and delay. We we see this parabolic arcs and people have written PhDs on this and uh, interpretation still going for the last 20 years. Um, but these are these are also some more data artifacts that I looked at during my master's research. Uh, yeah, parabolic arcs are cool. So this, these are some of the results. Unfortunately, I it was a null result. We ended up seeing a lot of noise uh, of course, it's all noise, right? It's all radio astronomy. Radio astronomy is all noise from space. Um, but people think we, we're out there listening to sounds of the universe. Uh, we found that the secondary cross spectra, the, the cross correlation between LCP and RCP was supposed to give us our most promising result. But uh, due to the, our pulsar was so bright that the noise from the pulsar itself was kind of drowning out the signal that we were looking for, the birefringent signal. Um, so uh, the conclusion is that we should look at more distant pulsars and observe at lower frequencies. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about the telescope that I, that where the data came from. Uh, the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa is um, the instrument that I um, got my data from. Um, and it's, it's pretty recent in, and we were banking on the sensitivity of the meerkat for a lot to allow us to see this birefringent phase difference but uh well that's just science right i, I wish well onwards so i uh, just wanted to conclude by talking about the future uh the meerkat will one day uh, become a part of the square kilometer array the largest radio telescope in the world until we get out to space and we can build radio telescopes on the other side of the moon uh, and uh, the SKA uh, is currently under construction, started construction this year. And uh, what's remarkable about the SKA is that the compute computational infrastructure that it will have will essentially pretty much it'll have it will analyze, it will process, it will have running through its guts more data in one weekend than the entire internet will have in one week. So uh, because of that, uh, we, we will no doubt have to invent uh, new novel techniques and algorithms uh, to analyze big data that will eventually trickle down towards enhancing uh, practices of how we run our public internet, um, public data networks, such as the internet that we all know and love. So uh, one half of this, so it's actually, it's two telescopes. It's one half of it is being built in South Africa. The, the higher frequency part and the other half, the lower frequency part is being built in Western Australia. So this, uh, there are currently 2000 known, more than 2000 known pulsars um, with the SKA. It's mo most likely that we will detect uh, even more thousands of pulsars and the Holy Grail, uh, I think in the coming uh, decade of research will be the, the pulsar and black hole binary. Um, I talked about neutron star binaries and they, they are few and in between uh, and they, they allow us to do some tests of relativity, but I think with the SKA, um, my prediction is that we will eventually observe some pulsar orbiting a black hole somewhere in the galaxy. <laughs> uh, and that I, I'm not, I have no PhD, but 
from my experience, from the, the research, I definitely think that's something to look forward to. Um, yeah, so uh, I'd like to take your questions. I hope we didn't go over time. Nope, you've got uh, three minutes left. Um, if you, anybody like to ask questions, if you if there's no one, I'd like to ask one. Anyone? Anyone, anyone? Unmute and just fire away. I got one. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I'm Pakun. Uh, uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson said uh, our stars, uh, the sun was formed by supernova supernova shockwave hitting a nebula. Can we yes. detect the source of the supernova? Can, can oh. we detect the source of the supernova? Uh, and what do you think happened to that first generation star? Yeah, um, what, what do I think that... Okay, I see two parts in that question. And actually, um, that's a good question. And one that I actually have some uh, merit to answer. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I wish I could open another slide that I had for another presentation. Are you guys still seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's true that uh, core collapse of stars in molecular clouds can be instigated by uh, supernova. And um, we actually, our solar system, and this, this is involving my research too, and it's quite beautiful and serendipitous that it does. Oh, nice, uh, nice. Our, nice, nice. Our solar system is enclosed in this bubble called the local bubble. And that's because uh, epochs ago or eons ago, there were massive stars that died out, uh, ejected all of their matter out into the universe, and created this local bubble, right? And we're inside of it. Uh, and inside the bubble, there's a deficiency of gas. And outside is the rest of the interstellar medium. Um, and when I'm, okay, my pulsar is about 500 light years away. Uh, and um, I, I better be careful with my light years and my parsecs. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so the boundary of that local bubble is about 120. I, I have, wait, 500 light years, 120 for a second. I'll have, but <laughs> it's less than basically that there's a wall of gas that is essentially what is lensing the, the pulsar emission before it comes to, to the telescope. And that's actually um, the, the gas cloud that I probe is actually the boundary of the local bubble. And uh, that local bubble was created by supernova uh, in ages past, uh, which also instigated the collapse of molecular clouds into stars. One of those stars might have been our sun. And uh, one of the, those stars that might have been our sun gave, uh, created, well, resulted in the creation of planets and planets harbor people and people harbor life and life harbors consciousness. So you can see how it goes back to uh, the, the supernova that you were referring to. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I can, I can, I'd like to show an image. Let's see if I can find it. One last slide because uh, we're eating into Mike's time already. Oh, all right. Um, no, it's quite all right. One last slide, one last slide. Mike's also talking yeah. about space. Yeah, uh, and there was a second part to your question. Uh, can we? Uh, what happened? What do you think happened to the to that to those parents, uh, grandparents? Star? What do you think happened to them? Pulsar, yeah. Um, so on, on the on the stellar evolution ladder, you know, if you have uh, small stars, they they become white dwarfs. Uh, but most likely, the stars that go supernova, they turn into neutron stars or black holes. So they are those. Uh, stars that became supernova are either currently neutron stars or black holes. Uh, yeah, and I, I do have it from one of my previous talks. Um, this is the local bubble right here. So you are somewhere inside there, and this shell, uh, this uh, shell is where the supernovas kind of cleared out all of the material from the surrounding space. Uh, and yeah, that's 
that's what I wanted to show. Good question, by the way. Thanks. Thank you. For <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Hey, thanks so much, Afik. It's always uh, interesting to, to listen to all these uh, pulsars and supernovas and whatnot. Uh, yeah. Thanks. But uh, yeah, we'll, uh, heck, we'll have to meet up again after the MCO is over. I know now we can go and eat in restaurants, but I think it's uh, not at 24,000 new cases. I think we better not. But we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, there'll come a time when we can. So uh, I'll take you guys out for, for uh, Makan. Okay. No problem. Uh, I I just yeah. want to apologize if, if I seem a bit um No no. No 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 don't no no don't don't no no stop stop no no don't don't do that. <laughs> it it takes away from your um your talk. So yeah, so don't don't never yeah. apologize uh, for your talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, you, you spend all that time preparing just to apologize. Duh, don't <laughs> thanks. Okay, anyway.